So thanks everyone for coming today to the next in our Practical Technology series. Uh, today we have two fantastic speakers who are going to be talking to us about DIY microscopes, uh, Dr. Mark Pickering and Joe Napper. So first up we have Mark Pickering. Mark's laboratory applies simple fabrication methods such as 3D printing for the development of low-cost and flexible lab tools such as microscopes. This has produced the Flexiscope, a low-cost, flexible, convertible and modular microscope with automated scanning and micromanipulation. He's also an active participant in the Dublin Maker Festival, live streaming activities related to their research which is focused on understanding the factors underpinning the structure and function of the nervous system. Mark's talk is called Punk Microscopy, How to Find Solutions to Imaging Problems When You Don't Know What You're Doing. So, Mark, go ahead. We need to go back in time a little bit. And uh, we need to go back specifically to 1976. So 1976 was a very important year for a number of different reasons. Uh, this video, uh, some of you may recognize, some of you may not, but this is the Sex Pistols. And 1976 was when they performed their first concerts. And this was a really sort of groundbreaking moment in the history of music. This ushered in the era of punk music and really everything changed after this point. 1976 was also the year that just across the water from the UK where punk was born, uh, there was a boy born. And this is him there. And uh, 45 years later, he'd be on a Zoom uh, webinar, uh, confusing a whole bunch of people who thought they were here to hear about microscopy. Uh, and I'm wondering why the hell he's talking about punk music. There's a reason. And the re what we need to do is we need to think about why did this happen when it happened? I mean, punk music, of course, not me being born. That's, that was up to my parents. Um, I'm not going to explain that one. But uh, why did punk music happen when it happened? So let's just go back a little bit beforehand. And a little bit before that, that was the era of prog rock. And prog rock got a bit weird. So what did music look like then? So, you know, as you can see, guitars sprouted extra necks. And this was the first arrival of synthesizers and, you know, incredibly complicated pieces of equipment. So, you know, to be a musician, you needed to be an engineer and an apprentice electrician and everything else all at the same time. And, and I don't even want to begin to think about what this is. But why was this important? Right. And what's the point that I'm making? At this point in time, music had gotten very complicated, very sophisticated. And it might have been accessible to the consumers, to the listeners, but wasn't necessarily accessible to the creators. And if this is what music looked like, if it was complicated and sophisticated and expensive to produce and difficult to produce, then this excluded a lot of people from it. And this is one of the reasons why punk happened when it did, because there was still lots of people sitting at home with cheap guitars who just wanted, had something to say. And got together and formed bands and hence a music revolution was born. Right, what's any of this got to do with microscopy? If the analogy, strained analogy hasn't hit you yet, where are we now in terms of microscopy? Microscopy has become a very expensive and a very complicated and a very sophisticated tool. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's allowed us to do things that we couldn't do previously. You know, we've got tools that allow us to sort of see in, in, in detail and resolution and dimensions that we haven't been able to see in the past. So sophistication is not a problem. But what is a problem is that loss of accessibility. So what I kind of want to see is a punk revolution in microscopy. But do what happened back in the 1970s. Let's get back to basics, strip away the detail, strip away the complexity, and look at the core principles of how it works and what it does. And I think that's an important thing maybe to do in terms of microscopy. And that's kind of what I did. And to explain why I had to do this, I need to kind of give a bit of a, a backstory. So we're going to change direction a little bit. And for a long time, I'm a neuroscientist, and, and I spent a lot of my time working on things like uh, I worked on myelin repair. And, and then something happened. I, I fell in love. And, and I fell in love with these. This is a comb jelly or tenophore. This is Pleurobrachia palaeus. And these are small marine invertebrates. And 
a few years ago, I came across a paper that described the nervous system in these things. And then I found them and I completely changed the direction of my lab. I was like, right, we're going to work on this. These things are beautiful. These things are amazing. Let's go look at this. And I haven't looked back. It was a kind of a crazy decision and it comes with consequences, right? So I was working in what was, you know, quite a well-funded area of research and then moved into something which is a bit obscure and a bit weird. Um, so, you know, if you're not familiar with neuroscience, this is essentially the equivalent of having a nice job in a you know, big investment bank and then, you know, <clears throat> quitting it all to pursue your dream and, you know, a career in interpretive dance or something. But what we had was these am amazing enigmatic little creatures. And what we were really interested in was their nervous system. And the thing about the nervous system in these animals is first it, form, it's formed in, it forms these beautiful kind of reticular organization, this nerve net, which is arranged the whole way around the body. And they're effectively spherical animals. And the nervous system, rather than being centralized, is spread the whole way around the body. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to look at it. And therefore, we knew we needed a microscope. And that was where the problem kicked in because we'd never worked with these animals. This was completely new to us. And there was not a huge number of people out there working with them. So we didn't have a huge well of expertise to tap into. And even some very basic questions. When we were right at the beginning, right starting off, we needed a microscope. We had enough money for our microscope, but what type? So simple, basic question. One of the most fundamental questions in sort of optical microscopy when you're looking at what you want, do you need an inverted microscope or do you need an upright microscope? And our kind of choice was born out of necessity. We only had enough money for one. Uh, and I was frustrated by this um, because my kind of answer was, well, why not both? And I kind of started to look and think about, well, surely a microscope could be both. Surely it could change. I mean, is there any reason why you can't just switch it around? I mean, it's a basic mechanical thing. And that fit of hubris led to me deciding, okay, I, I reckon I could build my own. I mean, how hard can it be? And it's really important to bear in mind, I had no idea what I was doing and I still mostly don't, right? I am not an expert. I will never be an expert on this, right? And I'll never claim to be an expert. That's a really important thing because if I can do this, anybody can do it. So we kind of stripped it down to basics. I read up a little bit on the optics and the basic sort of components of a microscope. And I kind of thought, well, if we strip everything away, what do we get? And that led us to develop the flexiscope. And what this is, is essentially we stripped all the parts away uh, and we stripped it down to its bare components. And we arranged the components in a way that made it sort of adaptive. So we could take the basic microscope and have it in an upright configuration. And then with a quick change, we could swap it around and turn it into an inverted configuration. We've got a nice little animation that makes it look very simple. It's not quite that simple. Uh, the sped up uh, video on the right shows how long it and shows the actual process. So it takes about 10 minutes. It does involve some disassembly and some reassembly, but it's a fairly straightforward process because it has this very basic central kind of design. Um, and one of the things I always like about this, this video here is that this video is taken in my lab and this was part of the uh, sort of supplementary materials that went into uh, the paper when we, when we published this. Um, so, you know, everything's nice and clean and tidy and everyone's wearing lab coats. Um, this is a slightly more accurate depiction of my lab. This was this morning. Uh, and that's Neve, who's uh, my PhD student, who's also working on some instrument design at the moment, who uh, looks a little shocked to see me pointing a camera at her. But uh, I just wanted to give a more realistic view of what designing your own microscopes and building your own microscopes actually looks like. So we had this basic component and we could flip it between an inverted and upright configuration. Brilliant, what does it do? Well, it allows us to do multi-channel fluorescence microscopy. So in this case, we're specifically looking at not our, our, our tenophore nervous system, but we're looking here at neurons in, uh, growing in culture. Uh, these are rat primary cultured neurons. And you can see we can do multi-channel fluorescence, just like you would be able to do on a, on a simple uh, uh, um, research, any kind of research microscope. But because we built it in a modular way, we can just swap components in and out. So when we don't want to do fluorescence, sometimes we want to image these things when they're still alive. This is oblique infrared illumination. And we swap out the camera, our fluorescence camera, and we swap in a, um, 
an infrared sensitive camera. And we can do this because we choose to use machine vision cameras rather than sort of cameras that are designed for microscopy. So our cameras are expensive. We put in specifically the camera are re relatively inexpensive and we can put in specifically the camera for whatever our task happens to be. And as you can see here, this is completely live, it's unstained tissue. You'll see a little vibration there. That's not instability of the, of the optical system. That's because this is a live moving animal with beating comb rows. And, and that movement that you see is actually the movement of the animal itself. So we can adapt this to use it for whatever we want. What we wanted to do, as I mentioned, was to map out the, the nervous system, to image the nervous system. So we take our animals and, and sort of prepare sort of slides with the, with the animal kind of spread out over a relatively large area. So it was very important to us that as well as just having the basic optical kind of capabilities, we also made it um, uh, sc capable of, of scanning essentially a whole slide. So we mechanized the stage. So we automated the stage and then the whole thing. So essentially we could take uh, um, repeated sort of Z stacks do um, extended depth of field kind of uh, um, compression of the images and then just do this repeatedly over the whole thing, tile out the entire image. And this is what we end up with. So we can take very, very large areas of, of, of the animals and scan over the entirety of the structure of the nervous system. So it did what we needed it to do. We needed it to be able to see reasonable levels of detail, reasonable resolution. We needed to be able to see fluorescence and we needed to be able to scan over the whole, over the whole thing. While we were at it, the other thing that we thought we were, we've never actually gotten around to doing it, <laughs> the thing that we thought we were going to be doing with these animals was some electrophysiology. So we also built into this uh, another sort of variation on the design. And in this case, we kept the stage fixed. So the stage with, with tissue on it would be fixed and we translated the microscope. Again, because everything is just modular, and just the bare components, you can just strip the motors out of the stage controls and put them instead onto the microscope. Now the microscope translates and you have a fixed stage. So now we've got essentially three microscopes in one system. But what we've done in this case, we don't need motorization on the stage. We can take those motors and apply them onto um, a, <clears throat> onto a micro manipulator system. And we were also able to do this. So we can reconfigure the entire thing for whatever our purposes happen to be. So it's a very adaptable kind of system. It's a, it's a very kind of useful kind of workhorse system that will kind of deal with most of the things that we can throw at it, but not all of them, which I'll come back to in a moment. And the design of this was, was, was my idea. I kind of dreamt it up. And then it was Amy who actually uh, went and did the hard work <laughs> and did the, the hard work of the characterization and, and really sort of, uh, um, the uh, getting the thing actually working. Um, so she's the real expert and she's the real brains behind the whole thing. We published this uh, back in 2020. So the entire system is inexpensive. Now I'll use that in inverted commas because it depends on your, your, uh, your, your sort of sense of perspective. And um, you know, later on, you're gonna hear from, from Joe and the open flexure microscope and the idea of a, a 17,000 euro microscope probably seems abhorrent to him. Um, but compared to, the other kind of research grade microscopes. And this is like ground up. This is everything you, you need. This is the objectives. This is the motorization. This is everything. 17,000. But you can go cheaper. So when we were doing this, we we're like, yeah, it's it's a cheap. It's cheaper than, than the commercial systems. And it's definitely cheaper than three commercial systems. But it's not that cheap. And where can we cut back? And this became a kind of the, an approach that we took. We would start with the functioning system and see, well, what can we lose? Well, how can we how can we minimize this? Because I kind of got very enthusiastic about this idea about making things as cheap as possible. So the first thing we did, our original system used sort of Torlab's uh, uh, piezo drivers for the uh, for the, to, the the stage, and they're very expensive, but they're also very very slow. And if you've ever actually used them, they make an incredibly annoying whining noise when they're running. So the other thing that we had to do was uh, that was the first thing we could change, right? So actually. Do we need exactly the level of precision that they, that they give us? Because that comes at a trade-off. They're very, very precise, but they're slow and they're expensive. So what we then did was, well, how can we do this? And we basically, because the other thing that we do a lot of is 3D printing. 3D printing has access control with stepper motors. So we thought, well, what if we just use the stepper motors? So we coupled the, uh, um, the stepper motors from the 3D printer 
onto uh, um, onto a stage, and then we had essentially the stepper controlled version, and this is significantly cheaper. Lacks a little bit in the precision, but much faster, uh, and obviously obviously much cheaper, and also doesn't make as much annoying noise when it's running, and it seems perfectly reliable as well. So this kind of got us thinking. This is our this was the kind of the end stage. We got this, we designed it, we published it, we were all happy, and then we moved on. Um, and what really got me interested was the idea that we built it around a 3D printer. We, we used the guts of a 3D printer on, on, our, on our stage. So then we got, we thought, well, well, what if we just use the 3D printer? So the first thing I did was I got a cheap 3D printer I built, in this case it was a Delta, and uh, I coupled a microscope on, I coupled a simple sort of objective coupled to a camera onto it just to see if that worked. And it did kind of work. But I thought, well, let's go, let's do this properly. So then what we did was we got the cheapest 3D printer I could find. And this was a Tronxy X1, which cost me 110 euros at the time. Came in a box of parts. And then we just stuck a microscope onto it and then kind of thought, well, let's see what happens when we do this. And it seemed to work pretty nice. And what this can do that our flexiscope couldn't do is it covers a very large area. In this case, the size of, you know, in, in centimeter scale. And that's really interesting for the use of essentially allowing us to scan an entire plate of cells. So we kind of expanded this and we refined it a little bit and we eventually then got the whole thing, stuck it in an incubator and had some cells growing. And ultimately this became the Incubot, uh, our little incubator robot, which is capable of sequentially scanning an entire plate of cells. So in this case, it's a 12 well plate uh, at cellular levels of resolution. Not quite as nice and clean as the as the flexiscope, but it does something different. It's it's serving a different purpose, and this was published uh, uh, just this year. Um, and this work, work was led by by George George Mercer in, in in my lab, um, and it's capable of oblique illumination as well and fluorescence. Uh, and it's also it's published with a nice graphical user interface and this step by step assembly guide. So this should be completely possible for anybody to kind of assemble this. And it's much cheaper than the flexiscope. It does something fundamentally different, right? It, we trade off that detail and resolution, but what we gain is, is speed and we gain the larger scanning area. So this costs around a thousand euros to assemble from scratch. Now, what else did we do? So we, this is kind of became, this, these were our first ventures. So then we kind of started to look again at, at the, we went back to our jellies. And, and one of the other things we were interested in was their, their 3D structure. So we built an optical projection tomography system, and this was lovely. We could get 3D scans of the structure of the animals, but these were fixed animals. And we wanted to be able to do this in live animals. So then one day I was just sort of playing uh, and we just had a cylindrical lens, we created a light sheet, we put it through our aquarium and then we spotted, as you can see here, this is the jellies as they transition through the light sheet. We kind of thought, oh, well, that's pretty. We were just playing around and it looked kind of pretty, but it's like, well, that's potentially useful. And we thought, well, maybe we could use light sheet uh, imaging to image the animals while they're still alive and get their 3D structure while they're still alive. We didn't have a light sheet microscope uh, and we didn't need a light sheet microscope. Um, all we did was we created the light sheet, we stuck a camera above it, and we, uh, we put the whole thing on, a, on the stage of a, of a 3D printer. Uh, and this allowed us to um, essentially uh, scan live animals in 3D. And this is what we actually produced. This is just using cheap components. This probably cost, and uh, you know, take the camera out of it. And, you know, the, well, I guess that was an expensive printer at the time, but, you know, the basic components of that cost maybe 20, 30 euros. Very, very simple, very, very basic. But it gave us what we needed, which was essentially 3D scans. And what we were able to do then is create optical phantoms, which we're using now to sort of establish, uh, uh, analyze the, the sort of motion of the animals. And, you know, because it's Christmas, we can also 3D print them and, uh, you know, create ourselves a nice little festive comb jelly shaped uh, Christmas decorations. So what are we doing now? Well, in keeping with this theme of why not both, uh, working with a colleague of mine a few years ago, 
he was interested in looking at some cells growing on a substrate and he, he didn't know whether he wanted to look at them sort of a, a, a broad field of view or high magnification so i kind of thought well why don't we do both we can look at them from both sides simultaneously and, that, and we developed this sort of dual view microscope and it was a single purpose it was for one experiment we designed it for one experiment it worked that was happy we moved on but it stuck with me and now this is what Neve is working on. And this is a very, very early prototype. And, and uh, what you may notice here is we've stolen some bits from a uh, open flexure uh, uh, system and coupled it onto, uh, this is very, very early in the, in the design stage, so don't panic. Um, but what we're trying to do is make a simple, low cost dual view microscope that simultaneously gives us a high and a low magnification view of the same specimen. Um, we'll hopefully, and the idea is to make this simple, low cost and robust because we want to be able to use this in the field. So that's kind of the next thing probably coming along along for us. And uh, yeah, we do have a lot of open flexion microscopes that we've tinkered and played with. So just uh, just to confirm, Joe, that there is, if you, I know you guys have a, a map of the world where you have open flexures, uh, make sure you add Ireland to that map. Um, and this is the point, right? I had no experience in this and I learned to build my microscopes and now we can solve, we'll build whatever optical device we need for whatever specific problem that we have. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. And this is where I think this gets interesting. So one of the other things that we do is we go to uh, take our work out in public and we do this, for example, this is at the Dublin Maker Festival. And this is Neve and, and, and George and Sanaa, people who've been in my lab and just sort of bringing our bits and pieces to the to the public. And our original, the Incubot, our original prototype of the Incubot was first piloted with kids at Double Maker. We connected the motion control system up with a uh, the controller from a Nintendo Wii, and kids were able to just pick it up and use it. And I kind of thought, well, if, if a 10-year-old can use it, so can a cell biologist. So we might be onto something here. Um, and... You know, when you talk to people, and you try to explain that we build microservices. So it was basically, you just put the pieces together. It's just like building Lego. So I kind of thought, well, why not use it out of Lego? So we designed a Lego fitting for an RMS threaded Lego fitting and, you know, started to sort of play around with building. Can we build a microscope out of Lego? And, and for Double Maker this year, we actually live streamed. This was kind of a scary thing to do. We live streamed me assembling a Lego microscope in real time. Um, and surprisingly, it sort of worked. Um, so this is it showing some um, histology. This is just a random histology slide. And remember, this is just Lego, a Raspberry Pi, and a random objective lens I had lying around the lab. Anybody could do this. Anybody could do this. And I don't mean any scientist. I mean anybody. Anybody who's curious. Right? And here we have another, just another little sample of a little uh, marine invertebrate that we found that shows up really nicely on this microscope. And... <clears throat> This is it, by the way. Uh, and of all the microscopes I've ever made, this is the one I'm most proud of. Uh, it's the most silly, ridiculous thing I've ever built, and it actually works. And this is the important thing. Anybody can do this. And, and so why should I have all the fun, right? I'm a scientist. I get to do this all day long. And that's my daughter there discovering um, fluorescence microscopy. Uh, we've just added some fluorescent dye onto an apple. That's what it looks like, by the way. It's pretty cool. Um, useless, but it looks nice. It's exciting to see. Anybody should be able to do this. And this, I think, is where I think that the real value of this is that we can put tools into anybody's hands. When people talk about citizen science, they often talk about it in terms of like getting the citizens to do the science for you. It's like the way some people talk about PhD students like they're, you know, the hired help. But actually, what if we just give the tools to people to let them make their own discoveries, ask their own questions? And this is why I think this approach to microscopy and instrumentation in general is important. We make things, we let people do their own things. So my advice to you to finish off, I've designed some microscopes to publish them. You can go and build them yourself if you want, but I recommend you don't. Um, I'd rather you built your own. I'd rather you took the inspiration and kind of thought, well, if he can do it, and he's an Egypt. Well, then I can probably do it because you probably can. The second bit of advice I'll give you is to play more. Right, A lot of the stuff that we've discovered we can do that we didn't know we can do, we got by just tinkering around with things. I mean, this is just something I threw together one day because I missed my bus and I was stuck in my office for an hour. I had some pieces lying around, threw it together and built a microscope just because that's what I do for fun. And it worked. And it's held, the stage is held together by coffee stirrers. 
and I'm using like surgical tape to hold the slide onto it. And it works. It's a microscope and it works. And if you're playing, you're going to fail most of the time, right? A lot of the things that we've tried to do didn't work. And that's okay, but sometimes you can make a discovery while you're doing that. You can come up with something. So even something really simple, like our little Lego brick, that's never going to be in a paper. But we put it out there. So we stuck it on NIH 3D Print Exchange. We also stuck it on Thingiverse. So anybody can find it and start building their own Lego optics. And even some of the slightly more serious things. So we were working on a design for a <coughs> light sheet system a few years ago. We came up with uh, 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 Neve, who, who you saw earlier, actually developed uh, this really nice system, which coupled uh, different lenses together, which makes a really nice beam expander slash telescope. The system we designed it for didn't work out, but that in itself is useful. So let's just put that out there and make sure other people can find it if that's the sort of thing that they might use in their designs. Okie doke, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, and if anyone has any uh, insults or whatever, feel free to get in touch. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks Mark. Really uh, interesting talk. So our second speaker today is Joe Napper. Joe is a developer on the 3D printed open flexion microscope and is working on a certified low cost medical device for point of care malaria diagnosis. Joe is currently working towards his PhD as part of the C3 Bio Initiative, Grand Challenges in Healthcare Technologies, in the lab of Richard Bowman at the University of Bath. Uh, Joe, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks. So, as I already mentioned, I'm Joe, and I'm doing my PhD on the open flexion microscope uh, under Richard, who I think gave a talk here a few months ago, talking about the development of the open flexion microscope, uh, the state of it at the moment. So I'll briefly recap that and then look at more about how open source microscopy can be customized and automated in the different environments that you might want to use it in. And then how that customization changes depending on that environment. So if you're using it as a novelty or a bit of fun in the lab, if you're using it for research, and finally, if you're using it as a medical device. So the history of the open flexion microscope started by examining a commercial microscope and really stripping it down. So I can't confirm or deny that Richard was inspired by the sex pistols, but it's looking at how much of the size, the weight, the cost, and the engineering of a commercial microscope can be decreased, leading to cheaper, more accessible microscopy, which people can use without feeling that it's a black box where a sample goes in and results come out. And building your own microscope, 3D printing it, leads to the open flexure microscope on the right here. Uh, it's around two orders of magnitude cheaper than a lot of commercial microscopes of a similar grade. And because it's 3D printed, it's easily replaced or repaired if something does go wrong in the lab and it gets damaged. The cheaper versions cost around 20 US dollars all the way up to around 200 US dollars for a lab grade research version like this. It takes a standard RMS objective and all of the other parts are widely available worldwide for a range of suppliers. Uh, and it's suitable for printing on a range of 3D printers, ranging from the ones here in Bath out to collaborators around the world, especially with people we work with in Tanzania. The magnifications provided by an RMS objective, we have a precision translation stage moved by stepper motors to move in X, Y, and Z. And we use a Pi camera for the imaging, which means that unlike some versions of low cost accessible microscopy, there's no need to leave a mobile phone in place. Uh, the microscope here is designed to be useful for long-term automated scanning, or time lapses in inaccessible areas like fume cupboards. So not le needing to leave your phone in there has proved quite popular. And very most importantly, it's an open source design. Uh, anyone can print the design, build it, use our instructions, customize it, share our design. If they do customize it, hopefully share that on as well so that we can share it with the community. Uh, a lot of the customization is in the hardware of the optics. 
So we started looking at transmission bright field in the top left here with uh, some red blood cells and then moved on to a similar design working in reflection illumination on the top right, looking at graphene samples, cross polarization imaging in the bottom left and multi-channel fluorescence uh, example in the bottom right. But the hardware can be customized based on the environment as well as the purpose. So whether it's aimed to be used in a lab or in education or in field work, and also for the range of budget, budgets and audience that you're going to be working with. On the left here, we have one of our collaborators, Joram, using the microscope in his lab to image those blood samples. In the center at the University of Nairobi, where they're focusing on uh, printing the microscopes in maker spaces to support education. And there it's not just about a different design for the microscope, it's separate instructions that school children and students can engage with. They can build their own microscope, uh, use it, and hopefully understand it and get more time because they physically put filters in place. They've assembled that light path for themselves. And that's not an opportunity that many undergraduates get with commercial microscopes. And finally, on the far right for remote field work, here you can see Julian, one of our supervisors, controlling the microscope in the middle of the rainforest, just using a little portable screen and a video game controller. It's also led to two spin off projects. On the left is the open flexure block stage, uh, it uses the same 3D printed hinges to move a precision stage in X, Y, and Z. Uh, it's used a lot in fiber alignment and any other times that you need precise positioning in 3D. And on the right is the open flexure delta stage, which is a larger version of the microscope, which can hold the optics in place and then move the sample in X, Y, and Z, holding the optics in place, letting users design more complex, larger imaging paths without worrying about alignment shifting while the uh, optics module moves around. Other variants have included going from an inverted microscope to an upright microscope. Stop me if you've heard this before. Uh, ours was designed by a undergraduate here and used the existing open flexure microscope design and went into the code that produces the design to flip the optics module and the actuator in Z, which lets heavier and larger samples be imaged. And as already mentioned, people have also used just individual components of our microscope, like the stage in larger experiments. So with Flexiscope and UC2 and a few other different designs. Once people have customized the microscope to whatever physical setup they want or swapping between them, it can be used in a number of ways. Most common and probably most simple is the software. Here you can see uh, our software lists the microscopes that you have available on your network, lets you connect and see the field of view that you'd be taking images of. And that's a live preview. You can move across to the navigation tab where users can define movements either using stage coordinates or by clicking and dragging and running autofocuses to make sure they're getting sharp images. If they're not happy with the autofocus they get, users can also manually change this. And once they're happy, uh, go into the captures tab where again there's a number of settings file names where you want it saved physically either on the microscope removable device or on your computer the resolution and also the automated scanning in x y and z uh, to set a large area scan running with various different autofocuses and naming styles scan orders and things like that once an image is saved you can access it from the gallery and make sure that you're seeing what you want. They can be, again, downloaded either onto a USB stick or directly onto the user's computer. And the settings is where we have a lot more of the customization, things like the exposure times, uh, the quality, if that's a limiting factor, and making sure that the microscope's moving in all three directions as expected. That's the most common way and covers the majority of use cases for the microscope. And that can be accessed either in someone's browser directly on the Raspberry Pi that controls the microscope uh, from your mobile phone or, and fully remotely. Having microscopes that are low cost enough that you can take them home if for whatever reason you can't get into your lab 
or remotely accessed in the middle of a global pandemic is something that turned out to be a lot more useful than we saw coming when we added it, but has definitely been a useful feature recently. For people that want complete control over the microscope more than the software allows, users can write scripts in Python or MATLAB to completely customize the control of the microscope. People less comfortable with code or if they're looking for inspiration on what the microscope can do, we have a Blockly interface where users can click and drag the blocks into place together to build the instructions. And when people do write code, uh, we invite them to share them online as extensions, which other people can then search for and install. And this large active community that we are building up is great. We have a website, a YouTube channel, an online forum full of suggestions. And these suggestions have ranged from new imaging modes and the uh, different spin-off projects that you've seen, all the way through to things like, can the microscope be powered using solar cells? and recently whether or not you can replace some of the elastic components with people's hair ties. And this enthusiasm and creativity is great when you're customizing an academic prototype, you're uh, playing in the lab trying to develop things, but there is another side to the OpenFlexer project where this level of customization needs to be very carefully controlled. And that's because we're working towards getting the microscope certified as a medical device for point of care diagnosis. Worldwide, malaria causes about a quarter of a million deaths a year, but is very treatable if it's diagnosed early. The World Health Organization used the term gold standard for manual optical microscopy, which is inaccessible in a lot of the remote areas that needs malaria treatment and diagnosis the most. And we're working towards the remote manufacturing of low cost 3D printed microscopes like OpenFlexer, hoping that that can increase the accessibility of this testing. The medical devices require certification for this under ISO 14971. And that standard, which you can just see the summary of on the screen now, requires complete control and understanding of the device and this great phrase comes up a lot, uh, reasonably foreseeable misuse, which I think considering that tells you a lot about what you think of what you're developing and also potentially what you think of people generally. And for this control and to avoid foreseeable misuse, we can't give the same level of customization. You can't give access to the browser, online extensions, custom code to all be freely installed. Instead, this is where customization needs to be planned in advance. It needs to uh, be designed along with the people that will be using it, and then it needs to be certified and locked. And so this is where we get a change in attitude from an academic prototype where we're trying to make the microscope more accessible and hopefully more fun, more understandable to a certified medical device where everything needs to be tested, understood, certified, and explained. Uh, a way of summing it up, academic prototypes, you can get away with saying, oh, well, it does that sometimes, let's try again. You can't do that for a medical device that is in a hospital designed to support the healthcare professionals there. So in our software, we have this checkbox to enable the uh, medical scanning. And this option locks down a lot of the settings and customization. And instead, we start replicating the procedure that doctors use for malaria diagnosis. So 100 unique fields of view, scrolling across the sample, regularly refocusing. And being able to automate this, instead of relying on manual microscopy, could free up healthcare professionals' time and work, but only if it's reliable. Otherwise, we have got them to print and build and add and use something that only adds to their workload. And you start risking increasing the chances of misdiagnosis and mistakes. So the emphasis here isn't on adding features and customization and creativity. It's on the confidence on just the essential features that we want to add. Probably the first of those essential features is refocusing. So imaging a blood sample, for malaria diagnosis needs a 100 times 1.25 NA objective 
which means that the range of positions that you can position the sample and the optics module relative to each other to get enough focus is about half a micron, which is much too precise for a low cost plastic microscope to just immediately return to every time directly. So instead we have to copy the way that a human would manually refocus on these samples, sweeping past the focus, remembering roughly where it is and what it looks like and returning to it. So we move the optics module through a range of heights, keep track of the sharpness. And rather than trying to move back directly to the peak, we deliberately undershoot and then start taking that Z stack from there, building up a series of images and then using the shape of the sharpness measure curve that we've built up to identify whether or not that image is the one that we're confident using. Then, although we have confidence in that autofocus procedure, it won't work if there's nothing to focus on. Irregularly shaped samples and consistent smears will often have fields of view where there's nothing to focus on. This doesn't just waste time or risk moving slightly out of focus. When there's no sample to focus on, the next sharpest image is going to be the front of the cover slip, which is somewhere between 70 and 170 microns away from the sample that you're trying to image. So after scrolling through an image like this, refocusing, 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 you can quickly get to the point that not only you're not focused on the sample, you can barely even resolve it. We're working on preventing this sort of wonder in focus by looking at each position's uh, field of views distribution of colors and comparing it to the background and the sample we're expecting. And if we think that the field of view is background with a confidence that the user can define, we just mark it as background and move on. Another option for customizing scans is the order of the images that you take. Originally, we'd offer uh, snaking through the scan, so moving up and down in columns, or raster scans where you start at the top and move down a column before returning to the top of the next column and scanning along. Obviously, for samples like this, starting somewhere on the background doesn't make as much sense as starting in the center and spiraling out. So that's another thing that we started to add. And now we can detect backgrounds. We can set scans uh, spiraling out from the center and start to detect when it stops gaining information and instead is just trying to image the background. This is part of improving the workflow by speeding up the acquisition rather than just following the instructions automatically and potentially wasting the user and the microscope's time. Another thing that we're looking to add is SLAM, a robotics problem, simultaneous localization and mapping. So mapping out an unknown environment while trying to locate yourself in that environment and moving through it. So an example of this is rescue drones where they might need to be sent to automatically map out an environment that people need rescuing from before you can send in the people to help. So imagine a drone with a camera working its way through this corridor, going through instructions like move forward and take another measurement and verifying that it's moved the way that it expects. Whereas if you tell it to move forward and instead it starts noticing that it's skewed to one side, how it can update its future instructions, understand the map, still know where it is inside that map and minimize the probability that it's going to get lost or damaged. For us, this is instead predicting how the microscope's gonna move based on the instructions we give it, how previous instructions have gone and adapting when it notices that something's gone wrong. We can then combine these moves, these autofocuses, the uh, order of images to have a live preview of scanning and tiling that doesn't rely on rectangular scans or external software. It just uses the images that the stage has been sent and the images themselves to tile in real time, and then also make that tile available once the scan's complete. Should then be able to use the final scan, which is smoothed out, to display to the user, and the user can then identify the areas that it thinks are interesting and it wants to move back to. And it can then move back to them, not just using stage coordinates, but actually checking as it goes that it's moving to the area you should expect. In practice, what would this look like? At the moment, our microscopes are printed out and assembled for Tanzania in uh, Dar es Salaam by our collaborators at Stick Lab. Uh, 
and then are provided to the Ifakara Health Institute, which is a medical research organization with clinics all across Tanzania. In these clinics, which can be either fairly central in large cities or remote clinics, the healthcare professionals can pre prepare the blood samples as they would for traditional diagnosis and then leave the microscopes automatically scanning the samples while they perform the other clinical work instead of having to manually scan over 100 to 200 fields of view. They should have the confidence that the microscope is going to scan the area of interest, reliably refocusing, avoiding the background, and verifying that its movements are what the healthcare professional asked for. Then it can build up these large-scale recreations of blood samples that couldn't be achieved by any single image, and the technicians will be able to examine them, annotate them, and share them, either identifying areas that they are concerned about, running diagnoses, or training technicians on samples that they can draw on instead of relying on a live field of view through a typical eyepiece. That is the sort of split that I was hoping to emphasize today, where customizing a microscope can be as much fun as Mark made it sound. And we do have fun adding all these features, the optics, uh, getting something that's suitable for education, for remote field work. Uh, the microscope has been used in over, well over a dozen countries and has worked from the climates of Tanzania all the way through to air-conditioned labs in Bath and also down in the Antarctic. And also the spin-off projects that it leads to, whether they're ours or being adapted and used in other people's labs. And then there's the flip side of customizing, the risks that come with it, how you need to plan these features in advance and make sure that you're fully confident in them rather than risking obstructing the healthcare professionals that you're trying to work with. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed that. And again, I welcome any questions and please get in touch. Fantastic. Thanks, Joe. So I'll just pass on now to uh, Jim Hasloff. For anyone who doesn't know Jim, he's a professor uh, of synthetic biology uh, in the Department of Plant Sciences here at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and I'll let you take it away, Jim. Great. Thanks, Steph. Um, we've got a couple of questions or a few questions already piled up in the, in the chat session, the Q&A session. First question was, there are many microscopes out there, but there is little info to compare and or curate them. Uh, which would you think are worth the look in the $200 range for cell microscopy? I think the answer to that is really, it very much depends on your specific question and your very specific application. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, there's a huge variety of things out there, um, but I think, um, it, it really depends on what it is that you, you want it to do uh, and what do you want that system to do. Um, and I think there's no, there's no short answer um, to that, unfortunately. So do you have any thoughts about um, registration or, or specimens that could be used to compare, or obviously things like resolution on a flat sample, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, like one of the, I mean, there, I know there is there, I mean, there are various sort of standards, you know, that, I mean, one of, I, actually one of the problems is that a lot of the standards are relatively expensive. Um, so, you know, you can use, you get something like uh, the, you know, the, the USAF um, test slide, right? And you could, you could image that on a whole bunch of different systems and compare them, compare them for resolution, compare them for contrast, you know, you can compare whatever you want. But the problem is that the the actual slide itself is more expensive than most of the systems. Um, so so that's prohibitive, I think. Um, and it'd be nicer if there was simpler standardized um, uh, systems that could be used. Um, uh, yeah, uh, that's the only thing I can think of. Joe, you must have some thoughts about this too. Yeah, for the thoughts on $200 microscopes, there's one in particular I recommend, but that's probably bias. Uh, in terms of comparing microscopes directly, <laughs> th there are the metrics out there. Uh, the US Air Force target, like you say, is great if you have access to them. Um, and it's nice being able to not just build up an understanding of the microscope's um, point spread function or the resolution you can get, but what contribution each component makes. Uh, to the point spread function. 
So where it's worth spending your budget if you're limited to $200, whether a better objective or a more expensive objective is the limiting factor or whether there's other places that you're better spending your budget. Uh, a standardized test that doesn't require a US Air Force target would be great. Um, hopefully, that's something that can be done because, as you say, when they cost more than the microscopes we're testing on and they need to be transported to the rural clinics we're dealing with, it becomes a lot less practical. What's your recommendation, by the way, Joe? That would be the open flexure microscope. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Follow up question, which is uh, uh, for the open flexure for Joe uh, what is the cost of the medical device microscope? The cost in parts is around $200. Uh, we don't claim that that's the cost of the microscope. That depends on your access to the 3D printer, if you can afford to buy in bulk, things like that. But $200 cost in parts, give or take the supply chain that you can get. How much feedback is coming in from the field in Tanzania, for example? So... We have a few microscopes running out in Tanzania on blood samples now. The autofocus development that I mentioned was specific because we had feedback saying that we were missing focus by a couple of microns at a time, which um, is enough to completely lose any resolution of the plasmodium parasites. So that, um, that feedback is what led to the development. We've now sent over the codes that should give them more feedback on that. We're going back and forth, making sure that it's working for them and doesn't just work in a nice air conditioned lab in Bath. Question for both speakers. Um, do we really need to adjust the microscopes for people who are not coding? Uh, so in my experience, every single student I work with learns a bit of coding for analysis or controlling hardware in a few days. So that's an interesting and provocative question. Do we really need um, you know, the, the, to cater to people who don't already or can't pick up coding? I think, I think this is actually a really interesting question um, because I think the answer is both yes and no. Right? In practical terms, um, I don't think we do, right? Because I think actually, the, 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 again, depending on what you want to do, right? It very much depends on what you want to do. But for a lot of you know, getting things working and getting basic things working and, you know, running an image acquisition system and, uh, you know, running motors and things like that. It's very, very easy to learn the code required to get that to work. Um, but I think that, so, you know, in, in real terms, I think no, but the flip side, I think, is that there are people who think it's harder than it is, right? And they're put off. Right. They think so anybody, so somebody who's never done any coding thinks it's incredibly difficult and incredibly specialized until you have to sit down and do it. But you're not going to make somebody sit, want to sit down and do it, you know, if it doesn't seem appealing and, and, and easy. Um, so I think that's that's the challenge. I think that's just it, it, as a general kind of uh, as a general principle, I think that's the challenge to a lot of the kind of DIY approach to instrumentation and and, and, and sort of lab automation and things like that, is that it's, I think it seems a lot harder. If you've never done it, it seems a lot harder than it, than it really is. Um, which is why I always try to, you know, really emphasize the point that, you know, you don't really need to know what you're doing to do something useful. Uh, and Joe, have you got uh, any thoughts there as well? I think probably quite similar thoughts. It all depends on the environment that you're hoping to use the microscope or whatever the device is. So, for example, in Tanzania, having the software is a lot more useful because they are specifically interested in running the microscope the same way over and over. Uh, one thing that we've talked about is teaching coding through the microscope in which case it's nice, I think, giving people the chance to use the software where they can click and drag and then telling them that they get to learn how to do that through coding instead. Definitely, if I was only going to choose one way to control the microscope from now on, either coding or through software, it would be through coding. But there's also times, I think, that it's the convenience of software that's either attractive to people that don't want to learn coding or... <laughs> 
just want to run something quickly. Yeah, I think our experience with Biomaker, which is all about you know accessible ways to deal, build and use instrumentation to make things accessible to non-coders, non-programmers, as it fits exactly with what Mark was saying. You're actually excluding people, actively excluding people. If you even the smallest barrier becomes impenetrable quite easily when people are really busy and have their other interests. And also there's a different way of thinking, I think, with um, biologists tend to be more graphically orientated and the, the different programming paradigms suit some people and not others. So I think the more, the greater the mixture, the better, I think. Question about manufacturing issues. So from a manufacturing perspective, uh, he was wondering uh, how sensitive these 3D printed parts are to bad prints, uh, inverted commas, and maybe in a subtle way that would be hard to troubleshoot. And I see that uh, Richard Bowman has added a, a reference in the chat if you haven't opened the chat. So I guess this is what this is a, a comment for Joe actually with the heavy reliance on 3D printing. Uh, sensitivity to bad prints. A lot of the time, if a print goes wrong, it's fairly obvious, and the troubleshooting is just to print the part again. Uh, if it's a more subtle failure, maybe one of the actuators, one of the things that physically moves the stage, if that's a subtle print that's failed, then it might get through the sort of first check and built into a microscope. But the first thing that's run on a microscope, once it's set up, is a calibration procedure where the stage is moved in X and Y. And we make sure that what we see on the camera is the kind of movements that we're expecting. And if not, then it can suggest that there's a problem with the print, which again is caught early. Uh, and the fact that troubleshooting largely is replacing the part that's failed rather than uh, a repair that requires a technician or a specialist, I think makes it a lot less of a concern how reliable the 3D prints are. Yeah, I guess one of the issues might be around the flexures themselves. That's probably the thing that makes puts open flexure in a quite distinct category. Do you find any particular common mode of failure in in those, or is it the, the printing is quite robust as a general rule? I'd say fairly robust. Uh, as part of the medical certification, we're doing a failure mode analysis, which is a systematic review of everything that fails, everything that could fail and how long before that failure is acceptable. So how many years back and forth can the microscope scroll before the stage breaking is acceptable? Uh, and so the common failures that we found there, like people screwing into the stage directly with too much force and starting to strip parts is something that we've picked up on and fixed fairly early on, I think. I'd definitely say that it's robust and it's not designed to only work on the expensive high precision printers either. Uh, it works on the printers here and also printers uh, more remote, which are often uh, made of recycled parts and the access to the filament and parts that we've got here isn't as reliable. So I think you'd be able to, with some confidence, get one printed out elsewhere. Um, but obviously, ideally, everyone would have a 3D printer and just keep playing around like Mark does. <clears throat> Mark, I had a, a biological question for you because you showed those images of the comb jellies mm. and they have these amazing flickering uh, patterns down the side of the, on the combs of the, of the jellies. Yes. Um, do you know, I mean, I presume that they're interference patterns. So I gather that there's bioluminescence inside the organism, but the multicolor flickering is due to interference yeah you know, so about the molecular basis or optical basis there it's typically the the uh, it's typically described as iridescence um mm. so i'm not sure i understand the physical basis of iridescence um <laughs> but i guess it is a, it is an interference isn't it uh, i'm not sure anyway but actually the specific species <laughs> species that we work with uh don't have any bioluminescence lots of them do but our ones don't um which is a bit of a pity because, yeah, it'd be nice to see. 
is again for Open Flexure. Um, have you managed to complete the medical device certification? And if not, uh, when do you expect that to be completed? Put you on the spot. Yeah, so we've not completed it yet. It's something that we're working towards. And a lot of the recent changes to the microscope, rather than adding the new features, have been about making it as reliable as possible for the certification. Uh, when do we expect it to be completed? Uh, how long is a piece of string? When it's ready, not before. Uh, so it is probably the main focus of the group at the moment, but it involves a lot of collaboration with the people out in Tanzania who are using it day to day to image blood samples. And it's only when we're all confident in it, they will go forward for that certification. So do you think there's applications for that in sort of more first world, you know, more pharma type markets, particularly when there's a lot of interest in sort of microspheres and micro nanoparticle type um, PCR type assays and other things where a microscope would be quite useful? I think the, the main advantages of it in the global north are more about how low cost it is, the fact it could be automated and then left running in fume cupboards or you know potentially having a series of them run at once i know that people have tried to use low cost open source microscopes to automatically identify graphene on sheets and things like that so the fact you can have so many of them running in parallel for you know much less than the cost of running one manual microscope means that there should be quite a lot of interest partly i think it's probably on us as a group that we keep insisting on printing the parts out in bright pink and orange and limiting how much people actually take us seriously. But this comes back to one of the early questions about how do you compare microscopes? Without that metric, we struggle to put a number on how confident people, um, how confidently people can use our microscope and hopefully start using it in Global North research centers. Can I just finish maybe on one last question, which is about software platforms, because it does seem quite an important aspect of low cost microscopy and of increasing importance, particularly as it moves into machine learning and image analysis, et cetera. Can you just, I mean, obviously the, I think the open flexure scope is perhaps had more development time and has been pushing into this more autonomous web-based interface, but also with Mark, with yours as well, there's this issue of software control. Could you just maybe, Mark, if you start with, how did you choose your software framework and, and why? Um, well, we, so we started with um, essentially uh, what was available to us. So, because again, our initial design, if we go back to the, the initial one, which is the FlexiScope and our initial um, motion control system was the, um, uh, use the, the Thor Labs Piezo um, system. So they had their own proprietary sort of um, software for that, which is one of the reasons why we kind of tried to move away from it. Um, so I guess in, in specific cases where you're using hardware components that may have specific software control, you can be limited. And this can be a particular issue with some camera systems. Um, so, and not so much in terms of uh, from a user point of view, but, but more from a sharing point of view. And it was, there was an issue we ran into. Um, so we had written some code to essentially automate our, our uh, entire analysis uh, or acquisition process. Um, but we couldn't share it because it required using uh, some of the, um, essentially it, it called on some, Python code from the, the manufacturers, which of course was required, but we couldn't redistribute that. That can be a difficulty when it comes to sharing. What I would say, what's something that we kind of had toyed with, we didn't quite work with the, with the hardware that we had at the time, but if I was going back to start again, what I would do is I would look at pre-existing systems. Um, so if you look at something like Micromanager, Micromanager is a pre-existing platform. It is open source. It's built around sort of ImageJ, so you can you can build a pipeline of uh, you know analysis around it. But also, there it, it allows you to have plugins to control your hardware. So that's I think 
that's something that we kind of got wrong. Um, I think if we if we were clever when we started, um, and again, this is this is where I think sometimes not being an expert shows. Um, but if we were clever when we started, we would have looked more closely at compatibility with pre-existing systems. Um, Do you know if anyone's got right? Image J and Micromanager working on a Raspberry Pi? There's some contradictory <laughs> things about it. Yeah, I I think I think I I, I think I have seen Image J running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, I'm not sure, but I think you could probably use at least for for um, uh, you know mo for motion control systems. If you're using a Raspberry Pi, that's that's ideal. I think yeah, for acquisition, if you're using things like the Raspberry Pi, but even things like you know there are things like you know OpenCV and things like that that could be really useful. You know there are lots of pre-built systems out there, and again, you don't necessarily need to be an expert on on the software. You just need to. It helps be familiar with what's available, um, but yeah, I think that's it's important. Maybe it's an important step. Maybe at the beginning of a design process, when you're thinking about the hardware, to think about how the software is going to work at the end. Uh, and I guess Joe, for the Open Flexure project, given that you've got you know, sort of common hardware in terms of the Raspberry Pi and the camera, etc., there might be an opportunity for people for, to cannibalize that if they haven't already. Yeah, so the way that the software has been chosen and designed is fairly similar to the hardware, which is what's available and what's accessible, and what can we make sure stays accessible. So uh, for the microscope running on a Raspberry Pi, um, the Raspberry Pi hosts a server, which people can then send requests to, and it's up to them, whichever they're most comfortable with, whether that is coding in Python and MATLAB, or using our software or running on the Pi directly. And we want to make sure that the images we produce are suitably named, that they can just be loaded directly into image J and Fiji if needs be. But it's about hopefully having all of the systems able to speak to each other instead of having two very similar microscopes on the table next to each other with software and systems that completely can't interact. Yeah, I was quite impressed you had Blockly as well for as a sort of a DIY type thing for people who are non-programmers. Is that run standalone on the Raspberry Pi? Or is that also, I mean, I imagine it must. Uh, that's a fairly recent thing. I've not actually been involved in it. Well, I think I'll explore that. That looks really interesting. Um, since we're on the topic of software, I wonder if people have considered the Silo 2 standard for instrument control um, with a web link. Do you want to um, ex expand on that? Because I'm not familiar with that standard. Great, well, thanks. Thanks, looks, looks very interesting. Now, last chance for any questions. If there are any questions, just raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll, I think we're, we're pretty much done. And I just want to thank Mark and Joe again for their, their talk, for entertaining. And uh, thanks very much for all of your participation. So thanks, thanks everyone. And thanks, Stefan, as well, for running the show.